Uh, good afternoon. Before we start the symposium, we will really appreciate if our colleagues uh, can ask for the microphone for the translation because uh, two of the presentations will be in Spanish. So I think that uh, we will need uh, that you ask for these uh, headphones for the translation system. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. We will start this symposium about uh, TB and diabetes. So you are very welcome for this uh, activity in this very large <laughs> conference room. And uh, let us introduce, uh, first of all, uh, how, uh, the chairs of this symposium, and then we will detail how we will proceed. Kerry, maybe you can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, sorry, that's a bit loud. Uh, my name's Kerry Viney. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Karolinska Institute. And I first became interested in TB and diabetes when I worked in the Pacific, where we had uh, a real problem with TB and diabetes and where we instituted collaborative activities. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Pedro Suarez. I am the senior director for the Infection Disease Unit at the Management Science for Health, based in Arlington. In US. So uh, this symposium is very important for us for two reasons. First of all, because we would like to share with you the regional situation of the TB and diabetes uh, comorbidity in Latin America and Caribbean region. And then we would like to share with you the experience of three countries, one from Latin America, Mexico, one from Africa, Ethiopia, and one from Asia, Afghanistan. And uh, then we will have uh, some kind of a uh, discussion uh, uh, with all the speakers to really understand what are the current achievements and the challenges that we have in this very important uh, comorbidity of TB and diabetes. Uh, by the way, we really appreciate the presence of the professor Harry uh, here. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, this, uh, he will help to us in this uh, very interesting discussion. So let us start the presentations. I would like to invite to Ernesto Montoro, who is uh, the regional advisor for the Lab Network and uh, for the World Health uh, Organization, and also from the Pan American Health Organization. And also, he is member for the Green Light Committee in Latin American and Caribbean regions. And he has uh, more than 30 years of experience dealing with the issues of the diagnosis uh, and the implementation of the TB programs in the regions. So he will present the situation uh, or the information that we have up to date in the Latin American and Caribbean regions. Ernesto, the floor is yours. Buenas tardes. Eh, gracias por permitirnos eh, hacer esta presentación. Acá. Bueno. Eh, como todos saben, actualmente el mundo eh, ve con preocupación la emergencia de una nueva pandemia, la de diabetes mellitus. Como consecuencia de notorios eh, cambios transicionales demográficos y epidemiológicos, así como de la globalización de estilos de vida no saludables y otros determinantes sociales de salud, además de la carga mundial de diabetes en la población adulta, creció de 108 millones de casos en 1980 a 422 millones en el 2014. Si estas tendencias continúan post-2014, esta carga mundial sobrepasará los 700 millones para el 2025. 
Esta nueva pandemia tiene un, un impacto marcado sobre la epidemia de tuberculosis. Se sabe que al igual que con la infección por el virus de monoeficiencia humana, la diabetes incrementa el riesgo de infección tuberculosis y de tuberculosis activa en aproximadamente tres veces, aunque el rango de los estimados del riesgo es variable. Además, los pacientes con tuberculosis y diabetes exhiben pobres resultados en el tratamiento antituberculoso. Bueno, la región de las Américas es la región en el mundo con más baja carga de tuberculosis y representa solamente el 3%. Esta incidencia ha disminuido en 1,8% por año y adicionalmente a los esfuerzos debe eh, mantener un acelerado disminución de un 10% por año para lograr las metas de objetivos sostenibles para el año 2030. La región de las Américas, para la región de las Américas, constituye un gran reto el control eh, de la tuberculosis en los cambios, los cambios demográficos, tales como la aceleración, eh, la urbanización acelerada y la transición eh, epidemiológica que ha mostrado con el incremento de las enfermedades no transmisibles, particularmente como es el caso de la diabetes mellitus. Aquí, como mencionábamos, se puede observar la transición epidemiológica y el aumento de las, de las enfermedades eh, no transmisibles, como son la diabetes mellitus, el alcoholismo, la dependencia de adicciones a las drogas y el hábito de fumar. Y como les mencionaba, entre los cambios demográficos se aumenta eh, o se presenta un envejecimiento de la población y los cambios o aumentos en las tasas de migración y el, el aumento de la urbanización. Tenemos, como les mencionaba, el aumento de la urbaniza, en la urbanización, como es el caso, se presenta en algunas ciudades de la región de Latinoamérica, como es el caso del Perú y Montevideo, donde se observa una gran, un gran porcentaje de las infecciones del total de la población, donde eh, se muestran los casos notificados y el total de casos MDR que se concentran en estas grandes ciudades. Vemos que en la región de Latinoamérica el 80% de la población vive en, grandes, en las grandes ciudades y que esto trae como consecuencia la desigualdad y la inequidad y además de la violencia, el incremento de la violencia en gran parte de estas ciudades. El estimado, o el estimado de casos en la región de las Américas para el 2016 se presenta eh, cinco, cinco, en cinco países, Brasil, Perú, México, Haití y Colombia, eh, representan el 70%, acumulan el 70% de la carga a nivel de la región de las Américas, seguido de otros países como son Bolivia, Argentina, Estados Unidos, Venezuela y Ecuador, con un total de casos nuevos de tuberculosis reportados de 273.000 574, que representa el 100%, pero como les decía, estos cinco países con esta carga de tuberculosis representan prácticamente el 70%. Bueno, para mostrarles los resultados, se, llevó a, se diseñó un estudio ecológico de eh, atribución poblacional del riesgo de enfermar de tuberculosis, condicionar a la prevalencia de diabetes y donde participaron la población adulta de 44 países de la región de las Américas y se realizó eh, la prevalencia, se analizó la prevalencia, la incidencia de casos de tuberculosis para el año 2013, donde fue, fueron analizados los datos de la población y el riesgo porcentual. Vemos que en estos países que les mencionábamos, estos cinco países de la alta carga de tuberculosis, vemos que la población, es decir, la, la incidencia de nuevos casos de tuberculosis, el por ciento, por ejemplo, para el Brasil, se presenta una incidencia por 100.000 habitantes de 46, lo que representa de 60.693 casos, y se atribuye eh, la incidencia de, eh, de diabetes mellitus en el caso de tuberculosis de un 16%, para 9.722 casos. En el caso del Perú, el porcentaje es de 8,3, México 
Haití 10,5%, Colombia 13,1% para una eh, incidencia de diabetes mellito de 16,8% para estos cinco países, lo que representa 25.045 casos de eh, tuberculosis y diabetes mellito como, o comorbilidad. Entre los resultados que estamos mostrando, ya mencionamos que la diabetes eh, representa el 16,8% para la incidencia de tuberculosis en el 2013 para estos cinco países y esto corresponde a 25.045 casos con un intervalo de confianza de los casos estimados para cada año. Así se menciona que uno de cada cuatro casos de incidente de tuberculosis presentan diabetes mellitus. Otros resultados muestran que este fue el primer trabajo que se realizó en la región de las Américas para conocer realmente la magnitud de este problema. Como les mencionábamos, estos cinco países que representan el 70% de la carga de tuberculosis en la región, la incidencia fue de 16% para Brasil, 8,3% Perú, México 19%, 10,5% eh, Haití respectivamente. Y eh, se recomienda que deben existir eh, un marco colaborativo para la atención y el control tanto de la tuberculosis y la diabetes para poder implementar y mitigar el, la, el impacto negativo que está eh, enfrentando la diabetes sobre eh, la epidemia de tuberculosis. Por ejemplo, vemos acá en el Perú el porcentaje de tamizaje de pacientes con tuberculosis en los cuales se ha hecho un tamizaje para diabetes mellitus y vemos que representa en el periodo 2013-2016 un 71,9% de, 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 del porcentaje con relación a la comorbilidad. Igual aquí vemos que este porcentaje de comorbilidad entre tuberculosis y diabetes para este periodo fue de 5,8%. Como conclusiones, presentamos que estos países con una alta carga de tuberculosis muestran un incremento en la incidencia, como es el caso de México, o un estancamiento en la disminución de la enfermedad en Brasil y Perú. Uno de estos importantes factores en la deceleración o el incremento puede eh, deberse a la comorbilidad entre tuberculosis y diabetes y con relación a las Américas, esto debe, eh, para cumplir los objetivos sostenibles, para el 2030, deben, eh, con relación a la incidencia, debe acelerarse la implementación de la estrategia fin de la TV, así como brindar un énfasis en el manejo de estas comorbilidades, no solamente para el caso de tuberculosis y diabetes, sino también de tuberculosis y VIH en todos los países. Por último, la diabetes representa, como hemos mencionado, el 16% de esta carga en las Américas, y eh, se recomienda la introducción de este marco colaborativo para todos los países, eh, priorizando eh, eh, como una prioridad del programa regional de tuberculosis. Y eh, se debe también implementar un monitoreo de este indicador para conocer la comorbilidad, el comportamiento de la comorbilidad de esta, eh, tanto diabetes como eh, tuberculosis. Muchas gracias. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Montoro. Okay, now we would like to invite to Dr. Diego Dereye from Ethiopia, I think. The next speaker. Uh, let me introduce to Dr. Dereye. Dr. Dereye is uh, currently the regional uh, director uh, for the Challenge TV uh, project in Ethiopia. This is a USAID funded project, and he has more than 25 years of uh, professional experience and uh, currently is working uh, for MSH. Uh, Dr. Dereye, the floor is Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Um, I will present our uh, experience as uh, a more of a pilot experience from Ethiopia on uh, innovative models for TV diabetes integration. Uh, there is a successful example from Ethiopia, so I'll be talking about uh, our uh, early experience. 
So this is an outline of my presentation. I will uh, give a big, bit of uh, background. Um, and then uh, the rationale for integration, the objective of the, the pilot work that we have done, the technical approach, um, and the methods. It's a combination of research and implementation. Um, there is a result from the pilot experience and lessons, and um, the progress that we have made, uh, our pilot experience, and some conclusions. So if some of you might, have, might remember some, uh, in Liverpool, we presented preliminary results of our uh, pilot experience. So we have been continuing to do our implementation after that. So uh, I will build on what was presented last year. Um, so the burden of chronic diseases uh, is expected to rise this is an estimate for 1990 uh, of 47%, and it's estimated that it will go to 69% by 2030. Um, of the chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases, diabetes is expected to contribute uh, a significant proportion, and there is an estimated rise from 300 million in 2010 to about 400 million in 2030. And um, of these numbers, almost 30% are expected to occur in low and middle income countries. And um, uh, there is a, on top of this, there is a high burden of TB and HIV in those uh, same settings. And uh, despite all the progress that we have seen, uh, they remain a challenge. So there is a dual or triple burden of diseases in uh, those settings. So what is the rationale? Um, it has been recommended since 2011 to uh, implement uh, integrated uh, services for TB and diabetes according to the global uh, WHO recommendations. Um, this is based on uh, the evidence that um, both TB and diabetes share uh, common risk factors. So any slight interaction uh, on any of the diseases could have uh, uh, devastating consequences um, uh, at global level. So the other rationale when you come to the clinical level is that patients with diabetes, they are often asymptomatic. Uh, they have atypical presentations. Uh, treatment outcomes are also poor. So this means that there is high chance of uh, missing these uh, patients. Uh, they also affect treatment outcomes. So our uh, targets of achieving uh, high uh, case detection and high treatment success rate is directly affected by the interaction between uh, the two diseases. Uh, evidence also suggests that there is some level of interaction between HIV infection and uh, diabetes. Uh, this has not been well studied. Uh, um, the interaction appears to be associated with the treatment itself of HIV. Uh, so, but more importantly, there is little programmatic experience uh, in uh, implementing uh, integrated services for TB, diabetes, and HIV uh, for the three conditions. So, but, so from our experience, the, we think that there is uh, an opportunity for synergism between the programs, especially in terms of building on the success of uh, the, some of the TB, HIV integration activities. So based on this rationale, uh, the objective of our pilot work was to demonstrate the feasibility of providing integrated care, not just for TB and diabetes, which is uh, recommended and people are trying to do, but also to build on the HIV work and see if we can integrate for all the three diseases in one setting. So this is a setting where we have done our uh, uh, work. Uh, Ethiopia is a big country, the second largest country in Africa, with a population close to 95 million or more. Um, the TB burden is also high. It's among the top 30 countries for TB, TB HIV, and MDR TB burden. Um, an estimate for diabetes, according to the International Diabetes Federation, uh, which was reported in 2013, uh, among the adult population, it's estimated that we have about 4.4% uh, patients with diabetes. So this pilot work was done between March and June 2015, 
Uh, we piloted this in two regions, Amhara and Oromia regions of Ethiopia, in, in four hospitals. So these are the areas uh, covered during uh, the project work. So the approach that we have used is, uh, if I describe uh, the inputs according to the project, what we did was uh, we had a small funding from MSH itself. Um, we supplied glucometer, lancet, and alcohol uh, swabs, and uh, we distributed existing guidelines and SOPs uh, to the sites. Uh, at regional bureau level, we had uh, focal persons who coordinated this effort with us. Uh, this was, activity was also endorsed by the national, uh, regional uh, health bureaus as a pilot for learning. Uh, so the project stuff, uh, we, what we did was we trained the health workers. We developed uh, separate training materials uh, for on-site orientation, trained health workers how to do integrated screening, and uh, we provided regular supervision and support. And we collected the data and analyzed uh, for further learning. So the health workers who were oriented by us, they did a screening for diabetes for patients for TB. Uh, HIV testing was done for both for TB and di diabetic patients. Uh, with, and uh, the screening for TB was done for uh, diabetes and HIV. So we, we didn't have uh, any good reason to do uh, uh, HIV testing for diabetic patients because we didn't think uh, there would be a different association at that level. So the regional focal persons uh, participated in our joint consultative meetings during the beginning, uh, midway, and uh, during the end of the pilot phase. And we also did joint monitoring of the progress in the four hospitals. So our goal was to, to scale up this experience uh, to more sites. Um, so, so for the screening tools, the, the screening tool is uh, we use for the for TB screening. Uh, we use the TB uh, symptom-based screening that was available for uh, uh, other uh, TB uh, patients, presumptive patients. For HIV screening, we use the standard national guideline, and we use the rapid test. Uh, for diabetes screening, we didn't have any standardized approach at that, at that time, so what we used was a risk scoring system, which was adapted uh, from uh, the published literature. We developed also a symptom-based screening uh, that, to see if there could be any association uh, in terms of picking the patients who are at risk of diabetes. So we confirmed a diagnosis with uh, fasting blood sugar among patients with uh, tuberculosis because these patients, when they come to the clinics, they are often, uh, uh, they come with uh, empty stomachs. So we use fasting among them, uh, but we use random blood sugar for patients with HIV. Uh, we also, based on the do documentation of the patient, any patient with, who is known to be diabetic and under follow-up is also confirmed to have habits in our pilot work. Um, so this is a risk scoring system that uh, we have uh, used. Um, so the, the parameters that were used are family history of diabetes, age group, hypertension, uh, waist circumference, um, current status of smoking, alcohol on a daily basis. And then the, with a the total score, if it goes uh, to five and more, then this patient is labeled as a high-risk patient, and patients with a five or less score were labeled as uh, low-risk low, low risk groups. Um, so based on this, the, this is the results of the uh, preliminary screening. We did this screening among uh, more than uh, uh, 3,500 patients. Um, for in DM clinics, the total is screened we had uh, close to 900 patients, and we found six patients with tuberculosis. Uh, this is about three times the national prevalence estimate in the uh, general population at that time. And, uh, uh, and then in the TB clinic, uh, we had uh, close to 440 patients, and about 2% of them had a fasting blood sugar level fulfilling the criteria for uh, diabetes, um, and the uh, co-infection with HIV was 12.5%. Uh, 
In the HIV clinic, we had more patients. More than 2,000 patients were screened, and uh, among them, about 1.5% had uh, random pl plasma sugar of more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. And co-infection with uh, TB is uh, high, which is 15.8%. So this was the, the pilot result. Um, so during the implementation, at the end of the, uh, these results, we also, during midway into the results, we discussed some of the implementation challenges uh, during this process. So the challenges were, um, for diabetes clinic, the service setup was a main problem because uh, first, the symptom-based screening was not efficient method to detect tuberculosis because most of the patients were asymptomatic. Um, so, and then organizing clinics for diabetic patients was a, was a problem because patients are treated in several different clinics. There is no organized way of giving service for diabetic patients uh, in those hospitals. Uh, so for that, what we used, we distributed um, tools and registers at uh, different places where the patients were being treated. For the asymptomatic uh, patient problem, we didn't solve that problem, but we rather put it as a recommendation for future action that we need to consider the use of chest X-ray as initial screening uh, among those patients. Uh, reporting and recording tools were also, they, they don't exist for diabetes because unlike the TB and HIV program, where we have a well-developed uh, recording and reporting tools, the diabetes clinics, there is no such organized system at the time of uh, this work. So our recommendation for that was to prepare a separate reporting and recording tools uh, for, for these patients. Uh, we know the burden will be very high uh, to do this job, but this is one of the actions that we needed uh, to do. In the HIV and, and the TB clinics, Screening for diabetes using symptoms or any other simple tool was, was a problem <laughs> because, as you know, the symptoms, uh, they usually show acute problem. And um, uh, we have not also used uh, any validated tool. And these are the ones we adopted were from a textbook and published work. So we, we suggested to use a symptom-based screening as initial screener and then follow it by um, risk scoring system and then we can do uh, the blood test for the small uh, proportion of patients who can benefit from that. Uh, this is just a suggestion from our side. And, um, and the ART clinics, the main problem was that we had a large number of patients. As we have seen during the same period, we had, we had more than 2,000 patients. So we engaged nurses and um, lay providers working in the ART clinics to do the screening. And we also shortened the screening tool so that they could do it uh, on time. So after the pilot project, we have uh, had some uh, progress uh, at national level. We discussed this in the working group with the NTP and also with the NCD work, uh, case team uh, to identify TBDM as a, as a priority. And um, um, there is also there is a dedicated section on the revised national guideline uh, on the TB diabetes uh, uh, integrated service. This is part of the, uh, partly this is a contribution of the work that we have been doing in, in collaboration with the NTP. Um, at site level, under the Challenge TB project, what we did is we trained more health workers from more than 20 health facilities. We gave them on-site orientations and uh, sensitized the staff to continue to focus on the screening TB patients for diabetes and diabetic patients uh, for tuberculosis. Um, so routine screening is initiated and we are expecting more results uh, in the coming years. So in conclusion, um, integrated screening is feasible, uh, even in a setting with a high uh, um, burden of diseases and the limited resources. Um, and we think that if we scale up this kind of implementation, it may serve as uh, as entry point for finding people with both undiagnosed TB and diabetes. And there are some areas for further research that is, uh, interested people can continue to pursue this. And um, you know we don't have the best screening tools so far. Um, so I think we need to agree on the algorithms, how to do you know, better detect diabetes in, among TB patients. 
uh, and vice versa. And um, treatment outcomes in comorbid patients is not analyzed separately. There are uh, results that treatment, um, unsuccessful treatment is common in TB diabetes confected patients, but we need to do this in, in a more uh, robust data system and we need more information on that. Thank you very much. And if you are interested, you could, there is additional material. Uh, on, there is a technical brief on this. Uh, people can read. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Digo. Now, let us move to the Latin American region. And uh, we would like to invite to Dr. Martin Castellanos, who is the NTP manager in Mexico. He is a very senior TB expert in the region and in the country, and is leading this uh, project, this uh, control program for several years. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Pedro Guillermo. And thank you, all of you, to be here. And uh, I'm going to share our experience in Mexico working with uh, binomial tuber tuberculosis and diabetes. And uh, I really appreciate it if you comprehension. Then I will, my, my slice is going to be in English, but my speaking is going to be in Spanish. Como ustedes saben, la situación de la tuberculosis es una alta carga para muchos de nuestros países y representa una prioridad en la salud pública. De igual manera, la diabetes mellitus está convirtiendo, o se ha convertido en el principal problema de salud pública para todos los países de la región y del mundo. Como saben, un tercio de la población mundial está infectada por el vacilo de la tuberculosis, de acuerdo a las cifras que, que, que estima la Organización Mundial de la Salud, y de estos, más de 9 millones de personas y más de 1.4 millones de personas mueren cada año a causa de la tuberculosis. Esto en México representa ser poco más de 20 mil casos y poco más de 2 mil defunciones por tuberculosis. La tuberculosis, entonces, eh, per se, es la enfermedad que más muerte y sufrimiento ha ocasionado en la historia de la humanidad. Todos los que estamos aquí lo sabemos de sobra. En relación a la diabetes, me extraña la información que nos acaba de dar el, el doctor Montoro, me espanta más. Cerca de 500 millones de personas registradas con diabetes en el mundo, causando el 5% de todas las muertes. Y en México, esto representa 6.4 millones de casos prevalentes y 3.8 de casos que no nos sabemos o no se saben diabéticos en este país. Sin embargo, este, en general causa el 5% de todas las defusiones. Nosotros hicimos un, un análisis de, los últimos, de la última década, identificando a una cantidad importantísima de pacientes con este, información del estatus de su diabetes. De estos, el 94% conocían su estatus de diabetes y el de la población estudiada, el 19.29 conocía el diagnóstico de diabetes. Con todo esto, consideramos la incidencia, la tasa de incidencia de la tuberculosis de, 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 del binomio tuberculosis diabetes con un incremento del 82.64 con una P de 001 en este periodo, o sea, y la incidencia de tuberculosis sin la diabetes disminuía en 26.77%. Esto nos lleva a considerar que la tuberculosis justamente es la causante de que la incidencia de tuberculosis en México, o uno de los factores principales para considerar que la tuberculosis en México no baja a causa justamente de la diabetes. En esta misma, este, en esta misma análisis de la información, identificamos esto, ah, bueno, es lo que acabo de mencionar, este con hasta 82.64 del incremento de la incidencia para este periodo de 12 años. Ustedes pueden observar aquí, francamente, una tendencia al incremento de, la, de los casos de tuberculosis con diabetes en México, pasando del 2003 al 2016 con un incremento del 287% este, de, esta, de esta incidencia en binomio. Es decir, de 1.469 casos que identificábamos con tuberculosis más diabetes en el año 2003, a 5.686 casos con tuberculosis y diabetes en el año 2016. 
Esto significa entonces una alerta y una alarma muy importante para el abordaje bidireccional y conjunto entre ambos programas nacionales. Probablemente no se alcance a ver, pero los, los, de los 32 estados que integran México, hay algunas entidades que rebasan el 30% de la comorbilidad, tuberculosis y diabetes. Y en el mapa se muestra el área más cargada en el, en el Golfo de México y en el sur. Por eso, y tomando en cuenta las recomendaciones de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y de la Unión Internacional contra la Tuberculosis, en el, en el marco de colaboración en esta guía, nosotros nos pusimos a trabajar y trabajamos este, sobre… esta es la publicación… y trabajamos en un aspecto de este, investigación bidireccional para considerar la aplicación de este modelo y, y observar qué, qué resultaba del abordaje. La metodología que ustedes pueden ver fue la, evaluar la, la factibilidad y la eficiencia de la, de la guía de la, de la Unión. Eh, fue un diseño observación, una, un estudio de corte este, observacional prospectivo. Lo hicimos en 15 unidades de salud de primer nivel y los participantes fueron todos mayores de 20 años diagnosticados con diabetes o tuberculosis vistos en estas, clin, en estas 15 unidades de salud. La aplicación de la guía fue, esta, esta guía fue adaptada para, el, para el, este, el esquema de México y, e integramos a los pacientes este, en, die, en un periodo de 10 meses para buscarles intencionadamente tuberculosis y manejarlos también al mismo tiempo con el, les, un manejo bidireccional que le, podéis, le podemos llamar con los responsables del programa de tuberculosis y responsables del programa de, 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 de diabetes al mismo tiempo en una misma unidad. Los principales, resultados, perdón, los principales resultados hablan del diagnóstico de tuberculosis entre las personas con diabetes y viceversa y algunos resultados que vamos a poder observar. El modelo que nosotros aplicamos y adaptamos de la guía internacional recomendada por la OMS y la, la UICTER, la, la Unión, eh, lo consideramos en tres constructos principales la coordinación interprogramática conjunta para planear, capacitar, monitorear y evaluar. En el segundo constructo para diagnosticar, la, para hacer diagnóstico de la detección de tuberculosis en personas, de diabetes en personas con tuberculosis y viceversa. Pero aquí lo interesante, el tratamiento y el seguimiento tendrá que ser simultáneo y preferimos en, en la mayoría de los casos la insulinización de estos pacientes con un control glicémico semanal con un control mensual de, de glucosa central y con una hemoglobina glucosilada de manera trimestral. El 100% de los pacientes se cuidó de esta manera y, este, y en algunos pacientes que no, no llegaban a esto, pudimos considerar también la oportunidad de aplicar el tratamiento de tuberculosis latente. Hicimos un sistema, integramos un sistema de información y aunque no era el caso, pero aprovechamos también el binomio tuberculosis VIH para poder integrar, sin embargo, estos resultados no vienen al caso en este, en este trabajo. Por lo tanto, nuestra estrategia se basaba en que en cualquier persona con diabetes y fuera sintomático respiratorio, podíamos buscarle intencionadamente tuberculosis a través de la microscopía, es decir, la vaciloscopía, de acuerdo a la norma oficial mexicana de tuberculosis de la 006. Cuando este era negativo, aplicábamos además la radiografía y el cultivo y si era necesario lo mandábamos al siguiente nivel. Eh, si era positivo, estaba, lo incluíamos de inmediato en el tratamiento simultáneo este, en ambos programas. Este modelo bidireccional habla de la evaluación de factibilidad decía, y de la, de la eficiencia de la, de la guía eh, bueno, esto ya lo mencioné, perdón, se me fue. Y estos fueron los resultados. De más de 7.700 pacientes con diabetes identificados, identificamos, hicimos el estudio en 783. Y de más de 885 pacientes con tuberculosis, hicimos el estudio en 361. De estos resultaron 38 pacientes y de los cuales 27 se conocían con diagnóstico de tuberculosis previo, pero 11 11 personas con diabetes no conocían su diagnóstico de, de 11 personas con diabetes no conocían su diagnóstico de tuberculosis. Y de las de las 70 personas que identificamos con con este, TB y diabetes de los estudiados con tuberculosis, 51 
51 de ellos conocían su diagnóstico previo de, previo, previo de diabetes y 16 de ellos no lo conocían. Es decir, para algunos también fue la sorpresa el identificar una enfermedad cuando se conocían con la otra. De, este, este, de esta forma. ¿no? El seguimiento glicémico fue crucial para, para este, estos pacientes y lo que podemos observar aquí es que la hemoglobina, tanto las cifras de hemoglobina glucosilada como de la glucemia central mensual, como la de la este, glucemia capilar de manera semanal, muestra este, disminución paulatina a través de los seis meses del tiempo que duró el tratamiento de estos pacientes. Los resultados del tratamiento también eran contundentes, cuando a pesar de que la literatura internacional habla de que las personas con tuberculosis y diabetes no alcanzan cifras exitosas o muy exitosas de tratamiento, en México este estudio realizado en estas 15 unidades, logramos hasta 89.47% de éxito terapéutico en ellos. Esto quiere decir que el, cuando el abordaje es simultáneo entre ambos programas y el seguimiento cuidado, con estos detalles que acabamos de mencionar del control metabólico, etcétera, los pacientes pueden mejorar y lograr mejores resultados en su curación. Por lo tanto, la diabetes y la, y la diabetes mellitus es un, considerado por todos nosotros aquí en esta conferencia como una de las comorbilidades, por supuesto, más importantes que ahora tenemos que abordar en el camino este, adelante, para, siempre cuando trabajamos en tuberculosis. De esta misma manera, el, el, el manejo conjunto de ambas comorbilidades es esencial para lograr menos, mejores resultados en el tratamiento. Por supuesto que es muy necesario motivar la implementación de estos modelos de abordaje conjunto para que llevemos a feliz término a nuestros pacientes con tuberculosis ahora que estamos considerando la diabetes como la principal comorbilidad y que en muchos países, por lo menos en México, estamos considerando que es la causa por la cual no hemos podido bajar la incidencia de esta enfermedad en el país. Muchas gracias. Thanks so much, doctor Castellanos. Now, finally, we will present the experience from Afghanistan. Uh, unfortunately, the, our colleagues from Afghanistan, they couldn't uh, participate in this conference for visa reasons. So, we asked to our colleagues, Dr. Muluken Melese, who is a senior TB and HIV advisor working for MSH and who is uh, uh, working also with the Afghanistan team, to present uh, to do this presentation on behalf of the our colleagues uh, from Kabul. Uh, Dr. Moluken, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, the audience, for coming. Um, well, this is um, a project, a uh, USAID project implemented by MSH. It's a challenge TV project. So the data is collected on a routine uh, program based uh, to give an, uh, the highlight of you know, the TB situation in uh, Afghanistan, uh, the TB prevalence uh, of Afghanistan is estimated to be uh, 340 per 100,000, according to the 2016 WHO report. And the incidence is 189 per 100,000. And uh, according to the International Federation of Diabetics, uh, in 2015, there are about 930,000 um, diabetic patients in uh, Afghanistan. And the prevalence of diabetes is estimated to be, in the adult population, is estimated to be 6.6%. 6 um, this uh, study is conducted in uh, a routine uh, program base in uh, five provinces and uh, in diabetic clinics of uh, five provinces, both in a public and uh, private health facilities. Um, a total of 2,015 male and female diabetic mellitus patients were diagnosed and on treatment uh, for either type 1 or type 2 di diabetes were enrolled at the time of uh, this uh, TB screening. Um, to highlight the results, you know, the 
criteria we use for screening is symptom-based as a WHO uh, screening criteria, like having cough for two weeks, night sweating, loss of weight, and other constitutional symptoms. Um, health workers working in the diabetes clinics were trained on uh, the screening criteria, and they screen, and if there is um, cough or other, uh, according to the WHO definition, if uh, um, a case is presumptive, then um, sputum is collected and tested with gene expert. And for those cases with still a high degree of suspicion, chest x-rays were also taken and maybe a clinical diagnosis. Um, in total, uh, about 2015 um, diabetic patients were enrolled at the time of the study, and 23% of um, were male and 77% female. So I don't know um, the reason you know, for the high uh, 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 number among female. Um, the mean age was 15 years, 50 years, and 88% were married, 9% uh, widowed, 2.4% single, and uh, over 8% were illiterate. And 0.8% were addicts of uh, opiates and hashish. And the morning we presented, you know, the, uh, uh, the TB infection rate among drug users, and uh, it's more than 1,000 per 100,000 population, it's very high. But at this point, you know, we didn't um, uh, present, you know, the uh, poets or hashish addicts. About 93.5% of the patients were type 2 uh, diabetics, and only 6.5% are type 1 diabetics. And the mean body index um, was 27.9%, 20, and the uh, mean recent, I mean, at the, at, the, at the time of, you know, the data collection, the mean glycemic level was about 153 uh, milligram per deciliter. And these are the results. Um, in total, about 164% uh, of, uh, I mean, patients had uh, cough for more than two weeks, which is about 8% of the total diabetic patients. And um, all of them were tested with gene experts because they're only included, you know, uh, patients with uh, cough for two weeks and more. And um, about 17, which is 10.7%, were diagnosed to be having uh, a TB. And um, through a clinical means, Another two patients were diagnosed either by X-ray or clinical uh, uh, base. And in total, 19 patients, which is about 11.6% of uh, the presumptive case were TB positive. And if we change it to a population level uh, prevalence, the prevalence is about nine, 943 uh, per 100,000 uh, population, which is three times more than, you know, the general public um, prevalence level of the country. So when we see this, uh, I mean, as a limitation, you know, we didn't uh, um, analyze the, death, the data um, based on, you know, the glycemic level uh, and based on BMI and other factors, but just it's a cross-sectional, we didn't analyze, you know, um, uh, in that base, but I think for the future we'll do that. So, in conclusion, uh, the yield of TB among diabetes is very high, and uh, as WHO is recommending, it's um, high priority to include diabetic patients in um, to screen TB um, for all diabetic patients, as we are doing for HIV. Um, we're also recommending to have further study on uh, to see the relationship between the glycemic level and the TB prevalence or the TB incidence, and also to have you know, further studies on the relationship of the type of diabetes and TB. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Molukin. Uh, we would like to invite now to all the speakers to join us here and have a seat.
de podio, please. Uh, Doctor Moluken. Okay. And uh, now we will start the question and answer and comment section, and Kerry will chair this second part of this symposium. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So just while the speakers are coming up, I'd just like to thank them for four excellent presentations. And um, I've been attending these sessions for a while, and I can see the evolution of us talking just about bidirectional screening. Now we're talking about collaborative care. So I'm really pleased to see that we have some presentations which have looked at collaborative care in a range of settings. So we have plenty of time for questions now. Uh, we have one microphone here, I think. I'm not sure if we have one down that end. But if you have a question, please come up to the microphone. Just state your name and who you're addressing your question to before you ask your question. And we have lots of time, so please feel free to ask lots of questions. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, just like to say thank you for really four very clear, excellent presentations on this, especially about as you say, Kerry, collaborative integrative care. So I have a number of questions, but I'll just stick to one. So could you say something about infection control measures with integrated care? I, I remember in the days when we began to integrate HIV TB, this was slightly forgotten about. So in your diabetic clinics or in your health centers, when you diagnose somebody with infectious tuberculosis, uh, you have diabetes, patients, persons there, you have people with HIV there, people waiting to be diagnosed with those conditions. The infectious TB patient is a risk, transmission risk. So I'd just like to have your comments on, do you consider this? Do you have appropriate natural ventilation systems in your clinics, ultraviolet radiation? Uh, I'd just be very interested in how it works. Thanks, Tony. Uh, would you like to take that? Yeah. Bueno, gracias. Este justamente fue uno de los inconvenientes en la atención de las personas con, con diabetes descompensada, con glucemias muy elevadas que no se controlaban y que teníamos que derivarlos a las unidades de, de diabetes. En México tenemos más de 100 unidades exclusivas para la atención de las personas con diabetes, es decir, son clínicas especializadas y justamente el personal de estas unidades se negaba a recibir a pacientes infecciosos durante el tiempo que todavía están positivos. Y entonces, como no tenemos unidades adecuadas para el control de infecciones este, en las áreas de diabetes, por eso estos pacientes con tuberculosis que no, no mejoraban sus glicemias, algunos de ellos, tendríamos que pedirle al especialista de diabetes para que viniera a la unidad donde se atiende la persona con tuberculosis para no exponer a las demás personas que están con diabetes atendiéndose en la clínica de diabetes. Esto lo estamos reconsiderando ahora, justamente porque eh, México ha integrado un plan de control de infecciones en establecimientos de salud y estamos considerando estas unidades para hacer las adecuaciones que fuera necesario en las UNEMES que les llamamos aquí en México, para poder recibir este tipo de pacientes. En tanto no se tengan, seguiremos haciendo lo que, y lo que hicimos durante esta investigación, durante este estudio, este abordaje, eh, invitando al responsable, al, exper al experto en diabetes para que venga a la unidad de primer nivel donde se atiende el paciente con tuberculosis, para que ahí dé las recomendaciones de la insulinización o de lo que tenga que hacer para, para mejorar la glicemia. Okay, thank you. Diego, do you have anything to add to that about infection control in Ethiopia? Thank you uh, for the question on the infection control practice. Um, this has been a challenge, not only for the TB diabetes uh, collaboration. This is uh, one of the most commonly asked questions also for TB HIV collaboration, because uh, there are similarities with uh, the patients with diabetes have a low immunity, and they are uh, prone to the, uh, acquire infection. And uh, so, so, so the practice in general in, um, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, what we have done is we implement TB infection control measures uh, across all clinics. Um, starting from the triage, uh, we have uh, a team, a committee that looks at infection control practices in general. So that is the primary 
uh, prevention uh, approach that we use. But when a patient has uh, both TB and uh, diabetes, the primary unit of uh, care is in the, the TB clinic. Uh, so that's how we, and once the patient becomes uh, less infectious, uh, at least from uh, our understanding, then we can refer them for more regular care in the, TB, in the diabetes clinic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from anyone else in the audience? No? No other questions? Maybe give you one more minute. <laughs> yes, we have another question. Good. If you don't mind. <laughs> um, so I'm interested. So at the moment, I think WHO recommends that if you have diabetes, we should not be um, treating for latent TB infection. And the high rates that I've heard of in Mexico in all the, all the presentations. I just wonder again what our presenters think about this. We, this morning we had a comorbidity oral abstract session where Leonardo Martinez presented very nice data showing that as you went from normoglycemic to pre-diabetes to diabetes to uncontrolled diabetes, nevertheless this was a cross-sectional study, your risk of having latent TB infection increased and suggesting that maybe we should be targeting diabetes persons for screening and for treatment. And maybe if you say, well, that's too much to do, uh, targeting diabetes persons who have uncontrolled uh, diabetes. So I just wonder what, what people think about this. You know, we've got a terrible epidemic, two bad epidemics, and prevention is one of the key things under the WHO NTB strategy. Should we be testing for latent TB using tuberculin skin testing or IGRAs? And should we be giving people isoniazid preventive therapy or something a bit simpler like rifapentin and isoniazid? Great question. Thank you. I think it's um, an important point, you know, whether, you know, we need to have, you know, uh, preventive therapy for diabetic patients as we do for HIV and uh, children. Maybe, you know, for developing countries like um, IGRA or TST may be expensive, but can you venture, like, for HIV as a preventive ter therapy instead of, you know, treating, I mean, because you cannot diagnose latent TB. But it's, uh, it's a very good recommendation which we should look for in the future. Look, and can I ask you another question? Would you test everyone for diabetes for latent TB infection if that was the case? No. Okay, anyone else want to comment on the TB, latent TB infection issue? Or? Yes, uh, I would like just to comment on okay. the, the question regarding systematic screening of uh, LTBI in diabetics. Uh, the guidelines are for low and middle incidence countries, so the evidence was not there to, to uh, recommend systematic screening and testing. I think for high incidence countries, it's a whole different story, and I think the WHO are about to launch recommendations regarding latent tuberculosis for high incidence countries. Great, we'll take that as a comment, thank you. Okay, next question. Maybe, did we want to go, did you want to make a comment about latent TB infection? Yep, great. Sorry, just hold, hold for a minute. En un país como el nuestro, donde 15 millones de personas mayores de 20 años seguramente tienen diabetes, hacer una, una detección de tuberculosis en todos ellos resulta este, muy difícil para el abordaje. Lo que estamos haciendo es intentar eh, abordaje en, en zonas de alta carga, como en Tijuana, que aquí están mis colegas de, de Tijuana, Baja California, donde la intención es hacer búsqueda de tuberculosis en personas con diabetes descompensada a, a través del cuantiferón y no del PPD. El PPD, por supuesto, tiene algunas ventajas, pero el cuantiferón en ellos podría ser mucho mejor. Y por eso estamos intentando hacer un abordaje recién, próximamente, en el área de Tijuana y en, este, es posible en el estado de Sonora, que son estados de alta carga, 
y que pudiéramos este, con esto medir la posibilidad de poder hacer esta expansión de búsqueda intencionada de tuberculosis latente en ellos, en las personas con diabetes. De la otra forma, eh, si quisiéramos hacer a todas las personas con tuberculosis, de por sí tenemos considerado dentro de nuestra norma oficial mexicana el buscar intencionadamente diabetes simultáneamente al, al diagnóstico de tuberculosis. Esto sí está establecido. Thank you. Okay, next question, thanks. Hello, um, my name is Mary Armstrong Huff. I'm from Yale School of Public Health, and this is directed at Daegu. Um, you know, I, I think it's really exciting to hear about the scale up in Ethiopia. I work in Uganda, and it would be incredibly exciting to see something like that happening there. But what I'm wondering is, over the course of this scale up, are there any lessons learned about the use of risk scoring and your symptom screening for DM in the TB units? Are there any adaptations that need to be made for the East African context? You know, is there anything that you can tell us about what you've learned during the past year with that? So, I, 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 I didn't hear some parts of your question, but um, you wanted to know more about the risk scoring system, and, and yeah, I'm sorry, there's sorry, echoes out here. Yeah, my, there's, a, there's a terrible echo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about any lessons learned over the past year with the use of risk sc scoring and symptom screens in this particular population, because as this scales up across East Africa, I'm wondering if there are adaptations that need to be made for the region. So, so the risk scoring system uh, that we have used is, um, the, the first experience is, uh, it was used in Korea, <laughs> actually, first. So. We, we based our uh, um, scoring criteria based on their experience, and this is the first experience in Ethiopia to do this kind of scoring. So there is a more detailed analysis I didn't present here, and the risk scoring actually uh, is, uh, it clearly shows uh, um, patients who are at increased risk. If you have five or more risk, then there is about 2.8 times higher chance of having diabetes with a uh, blood testing. But the symptom-based screening is, uh, we just wanted to try it <laughs> because it has no uh, risk. Then we just wanted to see it because we use the classical symptoms of diabetes with their complications like the polyurias, polyphagia, and all those symptoms from the textbook. And we try to see this. Um, as a, it's very helpful to identify patients uh, with uncontrolled diabetes but it has no use in uh, identifying patients who, who are in pre-diabetes or, or who have uh, controlled diabetes. So if you want to rapidly identify something uh, in a patient with complicated problem, you can use them. Um, otherwise, um, the risk scoring system is uh, more relevant for a resource-limited setting to prioritize patients if you don't have enough glucometers and, and so on. So that, that was the experience. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Good afternoon. Thank you. It was a great session. Really impressive work by, uh, by your programs. Dr. Martin, I, I was uh, especially impressed by the Mexico experience uh, and its comprehensiveness uh, to cover care and integrated care. I'm wondering um, if you could share with us uh, your experiences with uh, getting your TB clinic nurses to take on some of this diabetes work? Was that difficult for you? And how were you successful uh, with that intervention? Por supuesto, la red TAS de enfermería en México, así le llamamos, es una red muy amplia de enfermeras que trabajan en, en el programa de tuberculosis pero ahora eh, lo que estamos considerando es, en, el, en, esta, en esta intervención, por supuesto que participaron las enfermeras fundamentalmente. Son ellas quienes, quienes este, derivan a los pacientes para la detección de una o de otra enfermedad. Pero sin la, en tuberculosis, sencillamente sin la enfermera no se puede trabajar. La enfermera es el pilar eh, más importante después del médico que hace el diagnóstico 
la enfermera es el pilar más importante para el seguimiento y consejería y sensibilización de los pacientes para el seguimiento de su tratamiento, para la adherencia y para las detecciones que se necesiten hacer. Siempre, siempre consideramos a las retas de enfermería como el pilar este, número uno para este abordaje y seguimiento de los pacientes. Thank you. Okay, next question. Thanks. Good afternoon. I am from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, I am interested in TB diabetes. I conducted a very small study in Bangladesh. I screened 17,000 diabetic patients and I got 37 TB patients. And you know, if, if we, and after calculation, it becomes uh, prevalence became double than the healthy control. In Bangladesh, the prevalence is 100 per 100,000, and in my case, this is around 200 per 100,000. So I was interested to um, continue further studies, but there was no encouragement. <laughs> so I would like to know how can I approach for funding to the organization. I don't know what I should approach to because there is a study from Afghanistan then close to Bangladesh, but no more encouragement. I would appreciate your suggestion how to approach for funding. It's the perennial question. <laughs> Does anyone want to take that question? How, how do we uh, get funding for this kind of work? How did, you, oh. how did you get funding for this kind of work? Oh, yeah. I, I heard the question. I know we are not relevant people to answer this, but uh, I did this pilot work with uh, very small funding from our uh, own organization. This was an uh, innovation challenge fund from MSH, and uh, I can tell you in person how much I used to, to, to show this. This is a very small amount of funding, uh, if you want to show. But we also do a lot of work, you know, implementation research as part of our our uh, project implementation rather than looking for funding. But I'm sure there are many people in this room who, who are also aware of funding sources and you can uh, network and we can also try to search for more work on this. Okay, any other comments on funding or? No, yes? No, no. okay, all right, next question. Hi, uh, my name is Rohul Abid, I'm from uh, Brown University Global Health Initiative. So I have two short questions. One is, uh, maybe I have missed that, uh, whether there is a similar trend of uh, pulmonary and extrapulmonary tuberculosis with diabetes. And the second question is, the combined treatment for diabetes and uh, TB is shown that it's better. So is it in, true for the remote places where you have very, like, preliminary kind of not so developed uh, treatment center, or is it true for the secondary uh, health centers where you have better like uh, renal clearance or that kind of, so that you can adjust the drugs and see whether there is any renal uh, involvement or not. Thank okay, you. thank you. Your questions, are they for Degu or who are your questions for? In general. Anyone. Okay. All right. We might just, we'll just go back to the funding issue. I think you wanted to mention the Global Fund. Is that right? For, for the funding question, I think you had something to add to that funding question. For the funding issue, did you want to add something to that? Global Fund. Was that right? I think the, <laughs> we'll come back to this question. Yeah. My advice is uh, to ask, so uh, I don't know which country... Uh, Bangladesh, I think. Collect the, make the question which country he lives. But uh, I think the Global Fund is, uh, the, has opportunities in, in order to make some intervention in his country. Mm -hmm. okay. Global Fund could be uh, a, a place to ask for uh, support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we'll get back to this last person's question. So did anyone want to respond to that, the differences between pulmonary, extrapulmonary? Sí. Yeah. Acerca de la pregunta que decían sobre la, el, la mejora del tratamiento, de los resultados del tratamiento cuando se llevan tratamientos simultáneos, verdaderamente eso sucede. O sea, es definitivo que cuando ambos programas eh, se manejan de manera diferente, eh, conjuntan y para tratar pacientes con tuberculosis y diabetes, deben, si se conjuntan, los resultados siempre serán mejores. 
Aquí la, la experiencia de muchas personas, de muchos expertos, quiero decir, que trabajan en diabetes y ahora con tuberculosis al mismo tiempo, hacen su consideración de que la mejor forma de tratar a estos pacientes es insulinizarlos durante el esquema de tratamiento de la tuberculosis. Sin embargo, hay criterios también en los que se puede eh, no usar la insulina porque estos pacientes están adecuadamente controlados con los hipoglucemiantes orales. Entonces, no en todos aplicaría la regla de insulinizarlos, pero en la mayoría de ellos se recomienda la insulinización durante los seis meses del tratamiento de la tuberculosis y está comprobado que les va mejor en sus resultados. I think um, in a, from the program setting, we always see you know, high uh, bacteriologist confirmed cases and the extra pulmonary. Well, it could be you no, know, um, it could be you no know, like the diabetic patients uh, develop more pulmonary, or could be you know, the diagnostic difficulty for extra pulmonary TB. But what we see is in um, many of our countries, we're working in many countries, so we see the same trend of high pulmonary TB. But it needs, you know, further study from uh, a research setup because we are just collecting from program setup. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question, please. Just to quickly comment, there are two published studies, cohort studies from India, or observational studies, where uh, the diabetic risk is exclusively for pulmonary TB, and in some cases actually a lower risk for extra pulmonary TB, mm -hmm. um, which fits with some other you know, experimental evidence. Yep, thank you, great, thanks. So, hello, I'm Renuka Gade, and I'm, I lead the global health function at BD. Um, my question was going to be on funding, but I see that there are no really good answers. But I also want to say I was on the board of Global Fund for four years. And yes, Global Fund does give you a provision to look at comorbidities mm -hmm. more now than ever before. But let's not forget that TB in itself needs more funding. And so I don't know how successful they are. And it would be really nice to bring in the World Diabetes Foundation or the Diabetes Federation into this equation. But I have a couple of thoughts and maybe panelists like yourselves can take this forward. We have the high-level ministerial meeting coming up in Russia in November. Uh, we have UNGA for TB. And if TB and diabetes is not actively debated, and there are a whole bunch of mechanisms on blended financing being debated now, I believe it's a missed opportunity because diabetes itself doesn't get the funding it deserves. And so if you think of now adding it on to TB, which also needs funding, it's not always an easy path. So getting to ANGA, how do we get there? And in your work and experiences, a follow-up question just for information, how many people with diabetes were dependent on insulinization, injectable insulins? Because care for that part of the population is very different from just delivery of a pill, because in the end, you want patients to be able to inject themselves. Um, full disclosure, BD was the first company to invent an insulin syringe in 1924, and therefore my interest, because we would love to partner with programs um, in a public-private collaboration, and hence my question. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you. That's great that you'd want to partner. That's fantastic. And I, I, just as a comment, um, WDF do provide some TB diabetes funding specifically, so that's great. Um, does anyone want to take that question about insulin? Did you have any data on that? No? Meleku, did you have any? No? I re in, Mexico, in Mexico, I really don't know how percentage of, uh, of the people with diabetes uh, take, use insulin. But uh, there are so many colleagues from Mexico here. Uh, then uh, They work in diabetes. I, I don't know if somebody can uh, participate. De los que trabajan en diabetes, ¿qué porcentaje de las, de las personas en México consideran usan la insulinización en nuestro país? 38%, 38%. Aproximadamente. Okay, thanks. And maybe that's something we should collect when we're doing these studies. Okay, next question. Hello. I'm Alejandro Sanchez from the University of Guadalajara, from here, and I've got a specific question. So, what's the percentage of patients? Uh, yeah, I can't hear you that what's, well. What's oh, great? Better. Yeah. All right. What's the percentage of 
of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis admitted for infection that have um, tuberculosis, more or less. Okay. Can, can you repeat that question? I didn't quite hear What's it. What's the percentage of patients with diabetic ketoacidosis admitted for infection with TB? Okay. Yep. Did you want to? Yeah. I think you know for uh, we didn't study that part um, because you know we took only you know the active cases, but that needs you know more study um, as uh, what's the infection rate, but especially if for future like you know preventive therapy, the infection rate among diabetic patients should be studied. All right, and I've got another question: Is there any target of glycated hemoglobin in which we can reduce the risk? to not uh, um, have any tuberculosis infection besides like uh, the ADA recommendation? I didn't quite get that question right. either, sorry. Can Is there any it? target level from glycated hemoglobin yep. in which the risk of getting tuberculosis decreases? Yeah. Yes, I think there is, but is there any comments from the panel about that? La hemoglobina glucosilada en el control de la diabetes solamente lo utilizamos justamente para eso, para, el, para medir el promedio de los últimos tres meses de su, de su glucemia. Eh, por supuesto nos indica cuando es muy, grave, muy alta, más arriba del 7.5%, estamos considerando que esta persona no está controlada en su diabetes, pero hay personas con tuberculosis y diabetes que cuando les hacemos la medición de la hemoglobina glucosilada, la elevan más allá de 10, 11 por ciento. Y entonces en ellos justamente la, la, la razón de medirla nos marca la pauta para enviar a este paciente con un especialista en diabetes para que le nivele su, su glucosa a fin de mejorar también el, el, la efectividad del tratamiento de la tuberculosis. Ese es el objetivo, no, no nos mide un riesgo de padecer o no tuberculosis, nos mide… La, la posibilidad de que este paciente tenga que ser tratado con especialistas para mejorar su glucemia. Nada más. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next question. Hi, César Ugarte from uh, Universidad Cayetano Heredia in Peru. Uh, I think, thanks for, for the great presentations. I, uh, I have a, two comments, especially with the latent infection and diabetes. Uh, I think we need to go further and look in countries like Peru, like Mexico, and other countries with uh, problems with diabetes and tuberculosis, what is the role to screening? For example, uh, we did a screening for latent TB in diabetes, and we get around 50% IGRA positives. But the problem is our countries didn't know how is the general population prevalence of IGRA positive. So we don't know if they have higher risk or, or lower risk. I think it's... Uh, a point we need to uh, be sure that we need to be in the research plans for the following years. The second uh, point is about insulin. Uh, we, we did a study in Peru in, in mark of this tandem project in, in four countries, and one thing we learned in Peru in our court is a lot of patients go to primary health care centers. The doctors uh, Give the, give the order for insulin, but the insulin is not available in primary health care centers usually. And also they don't have the glucometers to do the monitoring at home. So we have this wall to don't implement uh, at least in some of our settings to this kind of insulin. Maybe it's time also another point of research is how to implement diabetes management in these in this patients and primary health care centers, no? It's my comment. Thank you. Yeah, they're, they're great comments. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yep, yeah, one more. Yep. So it, it, it follows on my, my colleague's uh, comment from Peru. So if you have diabetes and TB, some 
studies have shown that you have an increased risk of dying, of death during TB treatment. And I think there was a study in Korea showing that if you are diabetic and you smoke, your risk of death during TB treatment is six times higher than if you just have tuberculosis. So I, I just wonder what we should be doing about diabetes. I, well, first of all, I don't think we know why people with diabetes TB die. But that should be on the research platform. It may be they're dying from diabetes stroke cardiovascular disease. And I just wanted to ask whether you take that into consideration. So obviously you're going to manage diabetes with metformin or maybe insulin, but do you consider obviously lifestyle, you must stop smoking if you're smoking, do you consider aspirin, do you consider statins? And if so, is that completely unworkable when someone has TB? Should we wait until they finish TB treatment before thinking about cardiovascular disease risk protection? Or should this become an integrated package? TB treatment with an aspirin, with a statin, with antiretroviral therapy? I don't know. I don't know. I think we need to first of all know why people die. Um, but any comments from the panel would be would be great. Okay, any comments from anyone on the panel? The panel is right here. Yeah. I'm you happy want to make to a comment, yeah, comment no, this, to the question? Hard, yeah, well, uh, this is Hardy Kornfeld uh, yeah, from UMass great. and EDOT's study. And actually, yeah, I was uh, author of, of a study that uh, referring to both the smoking and diabetes combination. Uh, from our most recent work in India, we do see that diabetic patients with TB have, at least at the level of whole blood gene expression, a, like a, a profound upregulation of numerous diabetic complication pathways mm -hmm. compared to diabetes without TB. So I think the suggestion that this may be a population, particularly if they have you know additive risk factors, a population for uh, some kind of uh, you know uh, preventive treatment for cardiovascular complications is I, I think that's a, an excellent uh, concept and a study that ought to be done. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Do we have any other responses to the? To Professor Harry's question. Yeah, I, I think these are very important comments. Um, we have we have actually seen uh, several studies from India, <laughs> and uh, especially your publications. And uh, but if you come to our setting in Africa, there is very limited experience. So, so what we have started in Ethiopia, for example, is a, an early exploration <laughs> of even starting to understand. The, the links between the two. And then the questions that you ask now are, are more details, and I think we, should, we need to work on those, and we have um, more opportunities for that. Yeah. yeah, sure. Thanks. I think that we are in the last five minutes of the symposium. So I have some kind of summary comments, if you allow it to me. First of all, I think that it's very clear that according to the information that we receive from our colleagues from Latin America, from Afghanistan, from Ethiopia, and several other countries, is that TB and diabetes is really a global problem. It's something that uh, is not like with, uh, it's not uh, exactly like we thought uh, 10 years back and say, oh, diabetes is a problem maybe in Mexico and other countries. It's really a, a global problem with different magnitude in different environments, but as you can see, in Afghanistan, it's almost a one million of uh, people with diabetes. This is amazing the number for uh, no more than 32 million inhabitants, almost the same proportion in Ethiopia and in other countries. So I think that the evidence that we collect from several studies and what experience of our countries put in my mind uh, this uh, concept, integration. We need to really modify our traditional uh, TV approach to think out of the box and to maybe uh, find new ways to develop a new service delivery model to integrate TB with diabetes and HIV. I think that the experience from Ethiopia, for example, is very illustrative about how we can really find new ways to really integrate and to be more consistent in this concept of the integration. The second, uh, my second comment is that maybe it's a time to really elevate these uh, ideas of several 
uh, operational research to translate in a more systematic way in the policy, in the national policy approach. And maybe this is the best approach to really ensure that the funding support to these strategies will, will be come from the government side and also from the donor, donors. I think that we have a good examples. Uh, I am very surprised, for example, for the uh, information from, uh, from Peru. It's almost uh, very interesting to see that the high proportion of the patients that are tested for diabetes, uh, TB patients tested for diabetes. So I think that this idea to translate the operational research approach to more uh, systematic policy, uh, national policy implementation is very important. And finally, I think that the idea to really get a more systematic information at the regional level through WHO and other mechanisms is very important because we need really more information to get better decisions. And just I would like to repeat something that I hear from a good NTP manager from one country. And he said, just do it. We don't need a perfect solutions, but we have enough evidence to just do it and to implement the approach that we know now that are working more or less very well in some countries. Hey, thank you. So we're inspired by the Nike slogan, just do it. <laughs> okay, well, we've, we've come to the end of our session, so I'd like to thank the speakers again, and I'd like to thank Pedro for co-chairing. Thank you very much. And thank you for your questions and very stimulating discussion, and uh, we'll finish there. So thanks very much.